<gasps> Back in my day, we had to pay for Team Fortress 2, and we liked it that way. Now get off my server! <laughs> This is Control Structure, episode 126 for April 18th, 2017. Big week to everyone listening. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs126 to see them. I am your host, Stephen Orvis, and with me is the other host, Andrew Bailey. Hi, Andrew. Get off my lawn! <laughs> 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 uh, that's pretty good. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's been a fortnight this time. I think. Been a fortnight. I I honestly don't remember the last time I had the podcast. So, <laughs> so yeah, in that time, my bike's gotten repaired. And uh, did I ever tell you about my uh, gear shift going bad in mm. my car? In your car? Oh yes, yes. There's something like you pulled a pin or something. You like dug underneath the console and you pulled a pin and it worked. And you went to the advanced store. And bought something and yes. it was the wrong one or yeah. something. Yeah, so uh, apparently, uh, like, I had to, like, uh, strap, like, another piece of wire in there. Like, well, apparently that came out now. So my car is back to being all finicky, and I need to, like, push the button down underneath uh, to get the gear shift going again. Just put a piece of tape on it. It'll be fine. <laughs> I, I figure that's what I might actually do. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so got my bike fixed up. I actually uh, brought it back today, uh, or at least sometime this evening. Let's see, I've gone to two Easter egg hunts with the church, uh, you know, on different Saturdays. Um, so yeah, snapped a lot of pictures. Uh, let's see, da da da. I finished off all the leftovers. <laughs> From that one time my oh, parents came the, over and grilled. The one cookout that I never showed up to eat yeah. the leftovers for. Yeah, um, uh, let's see. It's been pretty nice, so I've been using the tea a lot to go to work. Uh, then, uh, let's see. I guess I can go ahead and say it now. Uh, so yeah, since I got fired and got rehired back, uh, that company uh, has decided to fly us pretty much all out to their town hall meeting or something. Uh, like, this week. Like, Tuesday... Or no, not Tuesday. Uh, Wednesday and Thursday. Oh, wow. So, like, I have to get up at the crack of too early o'clock on Wednesday and uh, get off to the airport and fly out, you know, and stuff. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty early. <laughs> yeah. And then we won't get back until, like, late Thursday. So, um, yeah. That's why I wanted you to come here early. Ha, I see. So you wouldn't, uh... <laughs> wouldn't be cutting in on your sleep time. Yeah, among other things. Yep. So, uh, did you do any hunting? Or no, you almost did, did hunting. I almost did hunting. Coming here in the street, there were a couple of deer in the street, and I'm like, this house is, so you just ran up into that guy's driveway there. <laughs> so if I get out and chase you, where are you gonna go? <laughs> just like running the streets in the town? Anyways, I, I suggested to Andrew that he should come and hunt them with me, but he declined. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> there there are too many liberals here, so. Raspberry? 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 Raspberry! So, uh, GPS hat, where's my cat? <laughs> Apparently now, it rhymes, I, I put it down like, hey, I made a rhyme. Anyways, uh, so there's a, a hat or a shield, if you will, that for the Raspberry Pi that lets you get the GPS location of that Pi, uh, and there's even an antenna you can plug in onto it. So if you have it in a box or something, you can put it out because apparently GPS doesn't go through metal boxes. They said, which yeah. does make sense. I've seen it with Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi doesn't go through metal. Uh, not well. Not well. <laughs> So, uh, so this this also has a real time clock on it. It does have a real time clock on it too, and I think it mentioned a battery or something. So presumably yep. your Pi could die, but the, it would keep the time, so it doesn't have to have internet to to record it. So my thought is we're gonna make this uh, 
3D printed case thing that straps onto the cat, so now we can see where the cat goes. <laughs> yeah, that would definitely be interesting there. I always wanted to do that with one of my animals, just like see where did they go anyways? Probably just like <laughs> in the chairs in the house and then just out the door and then another door outside. Anyways. Alright, so um, remember how that one guy from uh, Canonical wanted to, uh, you know, essentially you know, ask everyone on uh, Hacker News, like, what they found most annoying or what they wanted uh, in Ubuntu the most? Yes, we were talking about all the different suggestions and feedback that they yes. were bringing so, so the guy, uh, you know, goes on and says thank you uh, for uh, everything that, uh, you know, uh, for every suggestion and whatnot, and he also did some analysis, uh, and like it's definitely like one of the top ten or so threads on the site. Um, mm-hmm. So like he goes over some of the points, and uh, let's see, better uh, uh, let's see, groups as bunch as an OS, uh, yeah, fix slash boot space, clean up old kernels. Ouch, such an ugly, nasty problem. It personally pissed me off so much in 2010 that I created a script, Purge Old Kernels. And it personally pissed me off so much again in 2014 that I jammed it into the Biobu package, which I also author and maintain for the sole reason to get it into Ubuntu. That, that being said, that's the wrong approach. I've spoken with Lian Osagawara, the amazing manager and team lead for the kernel team, and she's committed to getting this problem solved once and for all in 17.10. Ideally, getting those fixes back ported to an old, to older releases. That to me sounds like uh, one of those red tape fixes where you have this red tape you have to go through to get this approved. He's like, ah, I already have this other one in. We just put it in there. <laughs> oh my. That will be a good one to have just in there. Yeah, so... And for some reason, I totally forgot to put this in the show notes, that, like, pretty much the day after we release the podcast, or, like, maybe the day of, uh-huh. is the day when uh, Ubuntu announced that they're not doing Unity anymore. I think it was, like, the day after, yes. Yeah. Yep, because you, you, you sent me a message about that. Yeah, so, um, for the next long-term release, which is going to be next April, uh, they are going to completely... Forget Unity ever happened and go back to GNOME. Uh, they're also going to scrap that one mere display server uh, and go to Wayland instead, mm-hmm. like everyone else. So, like, Ubuntu is just going to be, you know, is going to uh, go with the community consensus on things. I was reading articles about it, and it sounded like their driving force for doing this was they wanted to be in a position to make money as a company versus just being funded uh, by, um, I forget what his name is, the... the... Shuttleworth. Okay, yeah, I, I don't know his name, but the, the Ubuntu funder person, they, they want to make it so it can be a self-sufficient company, and that was one of the things they just didn't see themselves making money on from what yeah. I, I was Yeah, so, doing. and then also apparently they're dropping the phone and tablet stuff that we're doing, so, you know, along with that, oh, we don't need this customized UI anymore, we can just, you know, go back mm-hmm. to using, you know, what we were using before. Aha, so that's what what allowed them to do that. That makes sense. So, uh, like, I remember, you know, using one of, you know, some of the early releases of Ubuntu back when it was, like, pretty much all brown, (laughs) like, shades of brown and stuff. So, like, you know, Ubuntu is not moving to GNOME. It's going back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I used it back when it was the GNOME originally. I didn't like GNOME at the time, but since then, I've actually gone back to using GNOME most of the time on my desktop anyways, just because uh, the latest version of Cura doesn't work. Well, that's my slicer for my printing. So it doesn't work with Unity, so I've it works with GNOME, so I've just been using GNOME. I actually like GNOME pretty yeah. well, though. It's so, pretty good. So, yeah, you mentioned Cura before, and I was pretty sure that was like your 3D printing or something to do with 3D yeah, it's, printing. it's for slicing the, the models into the, the G-code. So, so yeah, I wasn't, I was not too far off from that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I guess you'll be using the mainline distribution, uh, fairly soon. So, uh, yeah, uh, let's see. I think they've gone back on their upstart, like they did this upstart daemon thing. And I think they're, they, they've gone back to system D 
for like oh, really? the for like the in, the initialization system. Is that the same one that uh, Red Hat would be using? Is I it, think okay. so. Because I remember the the Debian was one flavor and Red Hat was one flavor for the longest time. Like it was two different flavors. Or... Yeah. So um, let's see. I think they also went back on something else, but I can't forget. I can't remember remember what it was. So um, yeah. Uh, good on you, uh, Canonical. So, you know, let's, you know, the survival of the fittest has taken place elsewhere, and this is, you know, what everyone's decided on. So now let's go back to that and improve that now. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Electron uh, is a, how should I say this, a desktop framework for web apps. It's kind of like Flash, but it's in an EXE and not in a browser. So uh, you may have uh, come across a few of these before, like the Slack desktop app, and also Spotify, it looks like, and then uh, Atom, which is like an, like a text editor. So what Flack, uh, what, uh, what Electron is, is that it is a complete distribution, I guess, like a complete uh, system of Chrome, like the actual Google Chrome thing. Uh, so the thing about that is is that it's heavy, and each one of these apps has their own uh, like has their own copy of it, and they run independently of each other. Uh, so the thing about that is is that you have a few instances of Chrome doing Chrome things, like mysteriously eating up CPU uh, when it's doing nothing, uh, which prevents uh, like. You know, which, how should I say, prevents certain optimizations for battery life. So, like, you know, this guy is complaining that, you know, like, each one of these is using 5% at idle when it's mm-hmm. not doing anything. Um, so, he's pretty much says, you know, don't do this. <laughs> um, and tells users to start complaining about slow apps because, well, at least when this was written, it was 2016. We carry supercomputers in our pockets. It's not okay for things to be sluggish. And then tells programmers, performance matters. Memory usage matters. I don't care if you're, if you're the prettiest girl at the dance slack. I will quit you the moment I walk out of the office. I will delete you when I can. Uh, also, all you web devs, go learn uh, C or Rust or something. Your program <laughs> runs on a computer. Until you know how it works, you're doomed. And then the uh, get off my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and go read about the website obesity crisis. <laughs> it's funny and sad and true. <laughs> so uh, another language that you could learn is D, uh, which is uh, a C-like language. And I think it uh, also does like the C binary API. Um, like it's been around for over 10 years. And the reference compiler uh, has been uh, open sourced, so good on them. Um, of course, there there have been other open source compilers for D, which I think uh, GCC and Clang, uh, or was it LLVM or whatever they're calling it, uh, has had a uh, uh, compiler for D for a while. So, what are are there any uh, specific applications that you know of that were written in D? Uh, not offhand. Um, it's kind of like more of a, uh, like a convenient form of C, sort of, mm. in that, uh, I believe it does, uh, garbage collection, but it's also compiled. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, Math Jax, uh, which, you know, does those, uh, pretty math formulas that you might have seen on some websites. Uh, they're shutting down their own CDN their content distribution network. So if you want to use this, you'll need to like either switch CDNs or figure out how to host it yourself. Um, which I was kind of surprised that, uh, uh, due to the, due to having 29,000 PNGs, this can be a few megs. (laughs) Um, and that's like mostly for backwards compatibility. Uh, like most browsers can, you know, render this natively now. It's just the older ones. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Internet Explorer. <laughs> so, um, write good Bash scripts. Uh, here's a list of some uh, interesting tricks that you can do. 
uh, like especially set dash e, which means that if anything fails, the script is over. Um, there's a few other uh, few other tips in here, but I've yet to actually getting or get I've yet to actually get around to using them. Uh, but the set dash e is like eminently uh, uh, how should I say like useful immediately. So. Uh, remember how people are illegally fixing their tractors? I don't remember from prior to this, when the sh in the Fringe I did, we had the discussion about uh, how John Deere apparently is locking down the tractors so that yeah. if you change the transmission, oh, you need a service technician to <laughs> tell the computer that it's allowed. Yeah, so uh, you would probably be more uh, familiar with this than I would, but it turns out that you aren't, so... Oh, well. Um, so, you know, this sort of reaches back into the DMCA stuff in that, you know, Don John Deere has software in their tractors that has DRM on it. So if you want to pretty much fix anything with your tractor, you're going to have to, you know, deal with that. In which cases that means calling them up and wait for a service technician to come out. That won't be free. <laughs> uh, that won't be free. And, you know you've probably discovered that your tractor was broke because you were using it heavily at the time because like the harvest is like right now and like you'd have to wait a couple of days for a guy to come out and like if you need to like harvest right now that's bad yep. so you know it kind of goes back to the thing where you know like i kind of you know sort of noticed this, maybe not noticed, but like actually really understood that, you know, for all the technology stuff that we're talking about, agriculture is kind of like the first technology, if you think about it. Kind of is. Yeah, that's what made civilization possible. <laughs> and if people don't get their food, civilization falls apart. <laughs> this is true too. So that means farmers need to harvest things when they need to harvest things. You kind of have a similar argument going on with the iPhones and things with Apple and the whole deal with what you can jailbreak, what you can't jailbreak. Yeah. It really comes down to when a company sells you a product or you're allowed to abuse and use in any way you see fit. Yeah. So in order to get around this, farmers, uh, some farmers have resorted to uh, like some Ukrainian forum that actually sells some uh, like diagnostic software and uh, like software to do like other things to you know fix their tractor, uh, which like it seems like it's like about a thousand dollars total or something that they can do this to like completely unlock their tractors and like fix parts and stuff. So you know, good, but I don't think that they should have like been forced to get to this point. No. no. And it said that as uh, some of the states, they were trying to get through legislation that would allow them yeah. to... So, uh, so uh, you know, when you think of Nebraska, you think of a lot of cornfields, which, mm -hmm. you know, would be a big market for John Deere. So, uh, Nebraska, uh, let's see, this article is like a few weeks old at this point, I think. Uh, was at least considering getting a bill that would like allow this, you know, to not be uh, not be illegal. Uh, and uh, I forget if it was like some kind of representative or something like she was surprised that like, you know, no one really cares about us out here in Nebraska. But as soon as we talk about making it legal for people to fix their tractors, <laughs> suddenly we have like all these like all this John Deere representatives come through here. <laughs> so, yeah. That, like, kind of tells them, tells them where their priorities are, mm -hmm. I guess. So, uh, did you have any other uh, thing to add to this? Oh, uh, I had a quote. Let's find the quote. Where's it at? Oh, there you go. What happens in 20 years when there's a new tractor out and John Deere doesn't want to fix these anymore? That was a quote they were talking from a farmer's perspective. And that's quite a bit like the phones, computers. Uh, I have a joystick. It's a really nice joystick. It's like a wireless one and everything. Uh, it used to work with Windows 98, 
<laughs> there's drivers for Windows 98, but there's not drivers for any modern operating system. Because, you know, if they want to sell new joysticks, not the old joystick. Uh, so it's this kind of same deal there. Uh, have you tried Linux? Uh, I don't know that I have tried Linux on that specific one, but that would be definitely worth trying. Yeah, definitely. So um, getting around DRM might not be uh, illegal for much longer in Portugal. So, um, yeah, that that little country right next to Spain uh, is considering to make uh, copying for private use completely legal. Um, So, yeah, good on them, I guess. Mm -hmm. So uh, big changes are coming to Steam. So um, I've been uh, maybe not a fan of... uh, uh, Jim Sterling, but I've definitely been watching his videos for several years, and uh, especially with I think it was Digital Homicide that uh, like he's he has like an entire series of videos that is nothing but really bad trailers on Steam, uh, and uh, like he he will occasionally get one of these and like uh, play through them as a review you know, just like how bad they are. And, you know, he's, he's gone through countless asset flips, uh, which is essentially, um, so you remember that unity game engine? Mm -hmm. I do remember that. So that there's also a store like a unity asset store Mm -hmm. that, you know, you can go on buy models and stuff. And like, even like sort of, uh, sort of pre-made games that you're supposed to like replace things in. I see. Uh, but, uh, creative, uh, how should I say this? Uh, creatively bankrupt people sometimes get on there, you know, buy this, uh, sort of game framework thing and just like put, put it up as a game, you know, and that's called an asset flip. So they basically did nothing. They just go, Hey guys, look, this is a video game. (laughs) Pretty much. So, um, he's gone through a lot of that, you know, he's, he's, uh, like kind of tracked like the same identical zombie in different games, <laughs> the same identical, like sort of skull spider in different games, uh, that sort of looks scary, but it's not after you've seen it in like five really bad games. Uh, so, uh, apparently people have been, you know, putting these up on steam and apparently valve has taken to calling them fake games Kind of is if you didn't really work on it and you just got it from off-the-shelf parts. So uh, apparently the root of this problem is the Steam marketplace where all the all the trading cards and stuff are traded uh, because apparently the game creators get a chunk of that. Uh, so uh, Steam is looking into ways of solving this. Uh, number one is getting rid of green light, uh, which, you know, pretty much allows most, if not all of these, to come onto Steam, uh, replacing it with a Steam Direct uh, program, which it looks like it's going to jack up the uh, like the entry fee, application fee, by quite a lot. Uh, I think right now Greenlight is at 100 bucks, but they're looking at maybe upping it to 5000 That would make it harder to do for someone that has a great idea to get into it if they don't have money. But on the other hand, that means that you're not going to release 100 games that are just like you were talking about, the the ones that you didn't really make. Yeah. Um, And I have a feeling that most of those are made like, or quote, made, unquote, by like (laughs) 13-year-olds. Probably. Um, uh, Another thing is that they're going to have a Steam Explorers uh, sort of feature which people will go through a queue of games and flag them to say, hey, this is sort of good. And, uh, you know, might be looking at in the future. Uh, So, yeah, looks like, uh, you know, how should I say this? Back when Greenlight started, it was sort of a good idea. At the time, it sounded good, but it's turned out to be less than ideal. Because originally it was a way for developers to kind of submit a new game and let people try it out before it went like a full actual Steam game, right? Sort of. Like they would like post as like, oh, here's like a trailer. Here's a few screenshots and like here's some gameplay and here's a description of, you know, what it is. Uh, But it seems like a lot of those have also been like early access stuff 
that haven't actually gone anywhere. I see. Um, which is another thing that's sort of been plaguing Steam as well. Like, early access games that are not finished <laughs> and probably will never be finished. <laughs> let's, let's try this, because what we have now is not sort of working. I would like to appreciate HW Bench. It's a website that allows you to compare uh, pretty much any CPU with any other CPU and pretty much any GPU with about any other GPU, uh, which, uh, like, I stumbled across this uh, when I wanted to know if my uh, 2600 uh, processor uh, would stack up against, uh, I don't know, like, uh, Ryzen, uh, was it 7? 1800, which um, apparently, you know, it comes up with, uh, I believe it comes up with some benchmarks, you know, com for performance comparison, that uh, single-threaded, uh, the Ryzen chip is, like, maybe 15% faster, but multi-thread is a lot faster. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, you can use this, you know, because if you have some old hardware that you use daily, but it's fallen off the uh, the benchmark charts on all the popular websites, uh, you can you know use this sort of, to sort of gauge performance. Still keeps them on. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I think it it's a little handy there. So um, I'd also like to appreciate the seven zip test function, which using this you can it actually. Uh, extracts all the files from the archive in the background without actually extracting the files to the drive. So it probably extracts them to, like, the null or something. Dev null. Yeah, dev null. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, you know, works on Windows, of course. Um, there's It also uh, is a button on the uh, 7-zip GUI. Mm. So uh, you don't have to be at the command line for this, but uh, you can definitely script it. So uh, I sort of bring that up because uh, I've been converting the, uh, the hard drives downstairs in my basement, like the ones that I actually used to store, you know, like my file shares mm -hmm. on. I've been converting those over to BTRFS on uh, Lux. So like if you ever uh, looked at how uh, like software, encryption, software encrypted drives work on Linux... I believe there's Lux, which is, like, the key management, and then there's DMCrypt, which I guess does, like, all the other magical encryption stuff. And, like, what that does is it sort of creates a encrypted container on a drive upon which, uh, like, another file system can be inserted. Okay, so that's allowing you to, uh, well, kind of like you could almost see it as a partition, I suppose. Uh, sort of. So... Alright, print all. So you can see my, uh, I'm logged into my server downstairs. So you can see dev SDA, SDB, and that's the encrypted part right there. Mm -hmm. And then SDC, there's another encrypted part right there. And then you can see these dev mapper uh, things, which, you know, have the actual file system okay. on top of them. <laughs> so... Uh, like, I'm not sure if there's, like, a, a problem in the Zubuntu installer or something that prevents uh, BTRFS partitions uh, on these, you know, sort of encrypted containers. Uh, so, like, I was sort of wondering about that. Uh, so, like, I basically have a 4 gig drive down there that, you know, is pretty much my uh, sort of backup. Uh and then I have another two two terabyte drive that stores like backups of Steam and uh, GOG and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, stuff that you know could perish, but I really don't care. Mm -hmm. Well, I maybe maybe it not. It just takes a long time to download two two terabytes. Yeah, of stuff games. stuff that's like out there in the cloud, yeah. and I could get you know sort of easily if I needed to. Uh, so. Uh, like I transferred all those to my desktop up here, uh, then I, you know, did that, you know, uh, pretty much repaved it over. I was like, so I wonder if I can put BTRFS on this. 
So, you know, I copied over and, uh, and sure enough, I could get BTRFS working on this encrypted container. So I'm like, goody. Then I sent it back. Then I did like the main four terabyte one. So uh, eventually I want to do this with my external drives as well. But uh, apparently transferring like two or three terabytes over USB 2 takes a while. <laughs> that could definitely, <laughs> definitely take a while. <laughs> I remember the days of the USB 1.0 with the flash drives and just like a couple hundred megabytes takes a long time. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, I've been observing international backup awareness day with this, so back up all your stuff. And uh, if you'd like to submit feedback to the show, uh, go ahead and do that. Do that on the nexus.tv. So, um, yeah, I guess I'll go ahead and let you go down to, like, wherever your hotel is. Yes, I need to sleep because I was up at 2 driving in the morning, and I'm feeling it now. <laughs> yep, and meanwhile, I'll be flying off to Kansas City, uh mean sometime so um yep so have a good one you too